Radio. No sad podcast. Rhodium Radio. No sad podcast. In the city, city of Wilmington, we keep it rocking. So come on, shake, shake it for me, Kelly. Yeah, Dr. Dre is in full effect, and I gotta tell y'all a little something. Eze is down with us. MC Ring, you know he's down with us. DJ Yella is down with us. Arabian Prince, you know he's down with us. Tony A. The Wizard is down with us. JJ Fag is down with us. Timmy T, you know he's down with us. DJ Pooh Boy is down with us. Toddy B and Spade, they're down with us. My boy Ice Cube, you know he's down with us. I like to mention, so pay attention to where I'm from. Compton, but the tapes are from the rodeo. My name is Dre, listen while I play. And by the way, I'm also down with NWA. Yo, Steve at the rodeo is down with us. Slang and funky tapes, it is a must. We're number one. one, one, one. Tony A. Welcome everybody to Rhodium Radio episode 28. Uh, first and foremost, before we get started and I introduce my uh, very special guest uh, who I'm having an honor to be able to have this opportunity to interview. Um, I just want to say, you know, rest in peace to everyone um, pertaining to this uh, accident that happened today with uh, Kobe Bryant, his daughter daughter and uh the other individuals there that lost their uh lost their lives today uh i know la california and pretty pretty much all over the world is in mourning so the only thing i encourage everyone is to uh keep their families in in prayer because they're the ones that really need it in this terrible time right now while they're dealing with this so once again uh rest in peace kobe Bryant. i just wanted to say that i'm a huge huge laker fan but you know what first and foremost he was a, a husband and you know he was a son and uh, he was loved here and loved all over the world. So he will be greatly missed. They all will be greatly missed. So once again, uh, Rodeo Radio, episode 28. Uh, I'm a firm believer in promote yourself until it pays off. The Rodeo Mixtape documentary, we're going to be talking a little bit about that. Along with, uh, if you drop $25, people have been DMing me, inboxing me, and asking me, am I going to have any more CDs ready? Uh, yes, I have uh, several more. So if you hit... Uh, me on the super chat for 25 bucks you uh i'll mail these out to you or we actually put a donate button on our website documentary.com where let's just say you don't want to spend it on the super chat you can go to um our website donate 25 bucks or more and we'll send these out to you all you have to do is just uh send us your uh, e uh your um information name address etc um, other than that we're going to be getting into this very very special book which i encourage everyone to get to buy it um i'm not even halfway through yet but it's very very good very informative uh on the history of gangster rap but we're going to be getting into that right now but without further ado let me go ahead and introduce my good friend Soren Baker, thank you for coming. Tony A, thanks for having me, man. It's an honor to be here with you, man. Well, no, it's an honor to have you because you're you're usually, you know, interviewing me and Yeah, that's what my daughter said on the way here. She's <laughs> like, wait a minute, Daddy. You're yeah. the one that's always interviewing people. Now they're interviewing you. <laughs> that, that's a beautiful thing because I remember when I first did my first interview with you, my second one, I always got great positive feedback from people they said you know you two guys mesh well together yeah, yeah. Uh, um you know the conversations and the discussions were g good and flowing and i really like that i believe we have good chemistry and and you allow me to speak because there, there was a lot of things that i've said in my last interview that uh that were very dear to my heart about certain things that i didn't want to talk about but mm. i felt comfortable opening up well i appreciate that thanks for letting me be the one uh, you know? yeah well you know and like i said you know to be able to have you here is truly an honor because i have yet to see an interview uh with you you know as far as somebody interviewing you right, right. so i figured you know what let me go ahead and ask them and here, here we are yes uh before we get into the history of gangster rap because uh, i have a lot of questions uh from a fan's perspective on the history of gangster rap uh i want to people to get to know a little bit about yourself like for an example uh wh where were you born and where were you raised at yeah i'm born and raised in maryland okay so i grew up 
in a little teeny tiny town called Gambrels, which is right in between Baltimore and Washington. So it's about 20 miles from each. Okay. So uh, I grew up there. Annapolis is only about 10 miles away. So I got to spend a lot of time in Baltimore growing up, a lot of time in Annapolis growing up, and a lot of time in Washington, D.C. So I had a very uh, interesting childhood, man. I, uh, <laughs> it was very, very amazing. Yeah? So, yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, because I... I you walked in and you saw my Dallas Cowboys, you know, Dallas Cowboys football. And you told me growing up, you were a Redskins fan. Yeah. So my mom was born and raised in D.C. And I grew up a Redskins fan. And, uh, you know, when I was little, Doug Williams, first black uh, quarterback, won the Super Bowl. Just all the great teams the Redskins had back in that era. But then when Dan Snyder bought the team, the Ravens came in at around the same time. And after about a year... Maybe not even that long. I could tell Dan Snyder was about to undo the greatness that the Redskins had established for so long. Right. And I was just like, you know what? I don't know these Ravens dudes that well, but I'm going to roll with them because they're Baltimore. I love the Orioles. So I was like, man, the Redskins are out. And it hurt me because I'm a very loyal person. Right. But I just saw that this guy was dis he was desecrating the legacy of the Redskins. Right. And unfortunately... We've seen that play itself out in the entirety of his ownership of the franchise. So right. it was, and thankfully the Ravens have done really well, represent Baltimore phenomenally well. You know, we had, you know, the Ravens have done extremely well. And, you know, I love going to see them play. I went to the Rams game, so I saw them demolish the Rams in LA. That was phenomenal, 45 to 6. Dope. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the Reds, it just hurt my heart because. You know, I love Washington, right. and I love Baltimore, but we didn't have a team because the Colts had left when I was really little. Um, so, you know, but my mom, being from D.C., I just rolled with the Redskins. That's dope. You know, I, I, I will say this, because even though we're in the same uh, uh, division, <clears throat> I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan, a diehard Dallas Cowboy fan. Sorry to hear that. Uh, I know, I know. One of the few things I don't like about it. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, know what, you know what, though? I will say this, that whenever – one of our divisional teams was in the playoffs and like we weren't. I, of course, I, I'd root for whether it be the Eagles, whether it be the Skins or whatever. Giants. Yeah. Uh, but one of the <laughs> roughest teams that I didn't care for was the Giants, honestly. Uh -oh. uh, so, well, but, they had Lawrence Taylor. That's a lot. That's a lot to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's true. But I will say that when Daniel Snyder did uh, uh, um, uh, take over the team, uh, we did see a lot of changes. Even, it was terrible. Yeah, it was terrible. So, uh, there was a fan that asked that asked me, "Make sure you ask Soren uh, what's up with his uh, Baltimore Ravens, you know, because the playoffs." Yes. Well, the Ravens unfortunately picked a, the wrong time to have a bad game. So <laughs> I think that unfortunately a lot of the players didn't play well. I think for the first time really since the Chiefs game early in the season that they had made a lot of very questionable, strange coaching decisions by not having Mark Ingram, Gus Edwards, and even Justice Hill run more. It was just a very weird game on so many levels, and they, got, they didn't play their game. You know, the Ravens right. were very successful this season because they stuck to their formula other than really the Chiefs game that they lost early in the season, uh, week three. But other than that, they right. really stuck to their formula and stuck to their game plan even when they were down, the rare times they were uh, playing from behind or they didn't score right away. But because they were so successful, I think Lamar, uncharacteristically for him this year, uh, pressed a little too hard. I think the coaches abandoned their formula. And then you got to also give it up to the Titans. They played extremely yes, well. Yes, yes, and yes. that those three things combined, the Titans playing super well, the Ravens getting off their game plan. The Ravens not playing well. It's just it's just a bad combination, man. You know, right, and it's right. one and done. Right. You know, I think if the like baseball or hockey or uh, basketball had they had a five or seven game series, the Ravens probably would have won right, the right. rest of the games, yeah. or you know, would have won yeah. the series, but. Football is one and done, man. Yeah, yeah, no, that's why I love it. I bet you people are probably thinking, okay, am I watching PTI right now, ESPN? <laughs> I get it. We're going to get back into it. Yes. Uh, uh, growing up in Maryland, uh, uh, what elementary, junior high, and over there, is it called junior high? Yeah, well, at least when I was there. I think now it's middle school. Okay, yeah. In Maryland. But, uh, you know, I went to Four Seasons Elementary School, 
And then I went to a Rundle Middle School or a Rundle Junior High at the time, mm-hmm. and then a Rundle High School. So those are the three schools I went to. And they're uh, my elementary school is where I was from in Gambrels. My middle school was in Odenton. And then my high school was in Gambrels. The, the reason why I asked that specifically for you was because I have some friends that are from uh, Maryland. Oh, okay. Yeah, so them listening, they're like, okay, I probably went there. Uh, um, <laughs> You play any sports? I did. I played soccer, basketball, and baseball. And well, which one were you? Your strength? Would you say you? Were uh, basketball at? was what I was the best at. But you know, I played summer league and AAU and all that. And I, you know, got lightweight recruited. I had a couple of schools talk to me about playing there, but more like the smaller schools, nothing like <laughs> major. But I did have a campus visit at George Mason which was amazing because it was before they really took off. This was like the very beginning of their program because we had a basketball camp there one summer. And that was like that summer I probably at this camp, I should say, I shot like 66% from threes. I just played really well at that camp. So one of the assistant coaches was like, hey, man, you should come to campus and take a visit and everything. And uh, I did. And my dad went with me. And uh, I also got to give a shout out to Salisbury State. They wanted me to come play basketball and and soccer. But uh, I realized, I'll never forget, I played summer league. And uh, we had played, uh, we were going to play against a guy from Baltimore. Uh, This was in Largo, Maryland, but he was coming down and playing. And uh, our coach told us, his name was Dante Bright. He ended up playing at UMass and they went to the Final Four and all this. But our coach told us, he's like leading up for like a week. He was like, look, this dude is better than anyone you guys have ever played. He's better than any guys you will ever play. So don't worry about him. He's just way better. We were all like, yeah, whatever, dude. Yeah. <clears throat> we got to this game. He could have probably beat us by himself, one on five. And I'll never forget the, the, the play that changed my life. I played a two. So I was up by the three point uh, line. And then I came back to play defense. And he went around me, which. He got the ball, dribbled down the court, went around me, which by itself wasn't too bad. You know, he's a good player, whatever. Yeah. But literally, by the time I turned my head like that, he had already dunked. And I was like, oh, I got to find something else to do. Because I've never seen anything remotely like that. And he probably could have beat us by himself. (laughs) So I was like, oh, won't be playing professional basketball. (laughs) What else could I do with my life? Wow. Wow. Were, Were you a smart kid in school? Yeah, you could say that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you you would probably be the type of guy that I'd probably want to sit next to or in backup. So that way I yeah. can look at you, you know. I had a lot of that going on. Yeah. See, yeah. I was one of those guys. Yeah. Uh, g- g- growing up, did you play any instruments at all? You know, I had some uh, dalliances with some stuff. We had, I don't remember how it happened, but I was kind of forced into play an instrument either because of my school or some. And I just... Um, I didn't want to do what everybody else was doing, so for some reason I picked a viola. Okay. And I was just like, let me try this, you know, because no one else was playing it, and I had never even heard of it. Um, so I was like, let me just try to play this, and um, I wasn't good at it. And then uh, I, at that time I was always getting straight A's, and I was always, you know, doing really well. And I think I got a B, and my teacher wrote, even wrote on my paper like, oh, it's viola night, isn't it? I was like, man, my teacher's <laughs> dissing me. Right, like I'm a, right. I'm a straight A student. I'm like a perfect kid in class and all this stuff. And, and because I'm taking viola now, this teacher was like writing some of my, it's like, wow, you know, wow. that's kind of crazy. And then we had to play a uh, recorder. So okay. like the flute, uh, I don't know if you guys had that out here, but everybody, that was mandatory for some reason we had to play recorder. So Really? No, I didn't. I, well, out here, I remember we had like small gas engines on how to build uh engines uh we had a wood shop i'm sure okay. you probably had oh that. yeah we had home ec- wood yeah shop. there you go uh, yep. i i took a cooking class because i thought the teacher was fine as hell that's the only <laughs> reason why i took that cooking class i, I mean i don't i still don't even know how to cook mm-hmm. you know i mean but I, that's the reason why i did it and you know what one thing about me honestly i never really applied myself man because i oh i liked ditching i liked music we would go to my friend's house i, I say you applied yourself to being a dj Yes, I did. Yeah, I, well, I did. <laughs> not surprisingly, look what happened. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Quite successful at that. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm thankful for it because I spent a lot, a lot of hours practicing. 
Um, now, now, uh, growing up, what type of music would you say you were raised with? Uh, maybe what type of music that your mother or your father would play at home? Well, really at home, my dad was really into music. My mom would listen to whatever. So my mom uh, wasn't really, she didn't gravitate toward music. Whereas my dad, that was one of his main things. And he, oh, right. he, he loved the Beatles. Oh, okay. So that was really my indoctrination of music and what I grew up listening to as a kid before I was exposed to rap. Um, so as a little kid, there's a picture of my, my girl, Davida, she loves of my dad when I was a baby, like a newborn, uh -huh. has a picture of me in front of a typewriter with headphones on and he's holding me. So it's just so oh, ironic that's that that's what I became, you know, a writer and a music fan. That's so dope. my dad, I got to give him, you know, love you, dad. I got to give him all the, uh, you know, really the the joy and the blessing and the credit for introducing me to music and to having a love and an appreciation for it in the way that I do. He's really the one that developed that in me. And it was largely through the Beatles. Right, right. Okay. Uh, um, you, brothers, sisters? I got two younger brothers, one Dylan, he's two years younger than me and my brother Grant, who's six years younger than me. Okay, so, so you're the older, I'm the oldest, the protector. <laughs> the protector. Did you ever have to protect them from bullies? Nah, you know, I was in a very, I only had a couple problems in my whole life with that type of stuff. And then my brothers, uh, Grant was, you know, much younger than me. And then uh, Dylan, I think, ran into a little bit of that, but he's a big dude. So nobody was really going, okay. I, from what I could tell, nobody was going to mess with him. But then as time went on, Dylan actually spent a lot of time with me. So you know, he was always with me, so nothing was going to happen to him anyway. So, you know, it's funny. Uh, again, I always uh, say that I have, well, I do have five brothers, four older, one younger. Okay. Uh, my younger, he's probably watching right now. He was the guy that could swing him with anybody. <laughs> he was swinging with anybody. All my older brothers were all big. They were muscular. Uh, they were very protective of me. But every time I got bullied or got picked on, Everybody's always telling me, go tell your brothers, go tell your brother, he'll kick their ass, or whatever. But I never did. I mm. never got my brothers involved. Yeah. Uh, uh, years later, of course, we're adults now, I started telling them how I was getting picked on and getting bullied, and they all got so angry at me. They were like, if you would have told us. Exactly. Yeah. Like, if you would have told us. And I'm like, I, you know, I didn't want no, to bring no problems home, so I always try to solve all of that, you know, myself. But but it's whatever. You know, uh, um, other than that, um, you graduate high school. What did, what does Soren do next? I went to college. So college. I went to college at Xavier University in Ohio, Cincinnati, mm -hmm. um, because I didn't grow up poor by any means, but we didn't have any extra money. Okay. My dad worked and he was a school teacher and my mom stayed at home to raise us. So, mm -hmm. you know, we had a teacher's salary and three kids and my, my mom. So my dad worked. Uh, evening high school and then summer school and then my mom didn't work so we didn't have extra money and I bring all that up to say we never took any vacations and we didn't we took two vacations my whole life till I graduated high school one we drove to Florida to see my grandparents um, and then the other one was we drove to San Diego to see my dad's twin brother who was living in San Diego at the time hmm. so we drove across country so we took about wow. two weeks a yeah. uh, round trip to do that and we stayed with some of my parents friends along the way both coming and going but i wanted to see a lot of different parts of the country and i knew this was my opportunity to do that going to college because thankfully i was you know getting good grades and i got a lot of scholarships and different things and i knew that maryland and dc has phenomenal schools but I wanted to see a different part of the country. Yeah. So I told my parents when I started doing the applications, I want to go at least two states away. So I didn't want to go to where, you know, they could come see me if they just wanted to on Thursday. Right. Like I was like, nah, I want to go <laughs> see a different part of the country and I want to be on my own. So Xavier was uh, all things considered the best option for me. And it was a tremendous experience. I had a lot of things i didn't like about it but overall like it really gave me a huge stepping stone a huge platform with my writing and it really gave me a lot of perspective about 
Maryland being a phenomenal place to be from and an amazing place and you know it gave me a lot of perspective mm. because the other thing that I also did when I was in in Ohio was Xavier had a lot of people from Ohio, a lot of people from Kentucky, a lot of people from Indiana, a lot of people from Michigan and and West Virginia, those were the main states. So anytime someone that I was cool with was going home for the weekend, I'd try to go. Like, oh, my friend from Louisville is going home. I'd go to Louisville. My friend from Lexington's going home. I'd go to Lexington. My friend from Cleveland's going. I'm going to Cleveland. Dope. I'm going to East Lansing, Michigan. I'm going to Detroit. I'm going to all these places I had heard about, read about, knew about, but had never been. So I used that as opportunity, and we could dro we drove everywhere. Oh, wow. Yeah. So... You know, I was doing my own little tour, you know, and I was like going to Dayton, Ohio. I was like, man, this is where Roger and Zap's from. Like, this is amazing. <laughs> like this little town, like I, I couldn't believe it. And it was right near Cincinnati. Wow. And then Cincinnati has Bootsy Collins, of course. I actually saw him at a club one night when wow. I was there and I talked to him and he was like, who's this little boy coming up to me? Wow. But um, yeah, man, I just, and I got to know High Tech and Tyler Kweli when I was in college before they came out. You know, it was just, it was a very, I had a very interesting experience. And then uh, since I started writing when I was in college and getting into the big magazines when I was in college, I started, you know, flying around the country. Like I got flown to New York to interview De La Soul when I was in college. Shout out to Billy Johnson for that. And then I got flown out uh, when Hits Magazine was around. I don't know yeah, if you remember that. Yeah, Hits Magazine. They, yeah. uh, because of Hits, I got flown out to interview West Side Connection uh, when I was in college. Wow. So, you know, I was, I had kind of rigged and did my schedule. So I would only have class my junior year, second semester, junior year. I only had class because my writing was really taken off. I did it so I only had class Tuesday and Thursday. So I'd have a long weekend so I could travel. And then my senior year, I had Tuesday, uh, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay. But I did that so that. I knew and I saw these opportunities where I could go travel to write and get paid and like live my dream. But I was like, man, if I got class, I can't be missing class. <laughs> I got a scholarship. I got all these things I got to do to maintain my grades, but I'm living my dream and I got to like figure out how to, you know, manage that. So, 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 so what were you majoring in? I majored in communications and I got a minor in business because my goal was uh, growing up in Maryland, the the local news for us was the government, and the national news for everyone else was our local news because D.C. is where the country gets run and all the laws and all that. So I knew, um, I looked at things like journalism, I liked and respected, and my parents, uh, largely because of my dad, with the Washington Post. Like, we got all these newspapers when I was a kid, the Washington Post, the Baltimore Sun, the Capitol, which was the Annapolis newspaper, the Maryland Gazette. So I had all these newspapers coming in all the time. And my, my parents are both very intelligent. And my dad in particular is extremely well read. And he would read all the newspapers and he would talk to me about articles if I didn't understand something. But then when my dad realized I love rap, for some reason, the Washington Post covered rap a lot. Really? And there's no rappers at the time from DC. We were all in the go-go in DC. There was no rap scene, but my dad knew that I love rap and knew that I liked to read. So he would give me or make sure I saw in the Washington Post like they did articles on everybody. Mm. And I was shocked to see this, but it also showed me and I didn't it didn't register with me like, oh, you could write about rap as a job. And then when I got the source a couple years after that, then it was like, oh, some people have this as a job. I never thought about it because I'm in Maryland. There's no right. rap scene. There's no other than go-go in D.C. and a little bit in Baltimore with house music. There's no music industry there. And there's definitely no rap industry. There were no rappers from there other than I got a shout out Stinky Dink back in the day. And of course, like DJ Cool and D.C. Scorpio. But there were no guys that had huge careers that were on these big labels that people knew about at the time that were from the area and that were also repping the area. Okay. So there was nothing. Did, did the writing come easy to you? Or was it something you eventually got good at? Or can you say you were a natural at it? No, I wasn't a natural at all. But 
uh, I worked really hard at it and I did a lot of it. And again, my dad, he like, uh, back then it was fax machines. So I had to fax my articles in. Oh, wow. And um, my dad actually bought a fax machine and I would fax as many as I could, which was almost all of them, to my dad who bought a fax machine just to help me to have him read them and be like, so my, when I started writing, I was like, man, I've never written before like this. How do I write? And I literally just, when I would read the articles, I knew I could write that well because I could tell it wasn't something beyond my ability or skill set. Right, right. But I knew I wasn't there. Right. But then I was like, man, how do I do this? And I just was like, like looking at you, I'd be like, man, if I had to tell Tony A what I thought about the LOG and the Bulldogs album, what would I say? And then I just wrote it instead of saying it to someone. Oh, okay. Because I was like, oh, on this song, this is this. And on this song, I didn't like this. Or this is really clever. Or, oh, man, they use the same sample. Like, and that's how I wrote it. And wow. I had to learn how to make it flow and all that type of stuff. But I literally, I talked like that to my friends all day, every day anyway. So now I was just saying it so anybody could read it. Wow, that's dope. That's really dope. You know, now, I mean, of course, I was a, a big fan of the Source magazine. I will buy them all the time to get the latest hip hop news, if you will. Right. Uh, um, w when would you say, or around how old were you when you first got introduced or heard hip hop that you gravitated to it that you said, I like this, right? Oh, it was when I was 10. Um, I had heard rap before um, here and there and songs and stuff, but. For some reason, I just asked one of my friends one day when I was 10 years old, I was like, hey, man, you know, what do you know about this rap stuff? Like, I, I like it, but like, what do you know about it? And I, whatever I asked him, he's like, oh, I'll just make you a tape. He was my age, too. He was 10. Right. And I was like, man, there's enough rap to make a tape of? He's like, yeah, dude. Wow. wow. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, thought I, was like, that one. Yeah. I was like, oh, there's seven songs or something. That's all. I, I didn't know because I'm hearing rock. I'm hearing the Beatles. And... You know, back then, of course, rap wasn't really being played on the radio like that. Right, right. At least not when I was listening to the radio. So my friend Tom Early from uh, Four Seasons Elementary School, you know, he made me this tape. And he had, you know, all these amazing songs like uh, <clears throat> Nightmares by Dana Dane was on there. I yeah. Need a Beat, LL Cool J, You Talk Too Much, Run EMC, Big Mouth, Cur uh, Big Mouth by Houdini, Basketball, Curtis Blow. The show, Dougie Fresh and Get Fresh Crew, like uh, Roxanne Roxanne with UTFO. And I had heard like Rapper's Delight before. I had heard the message. I would heard some of these songs here and there. But, you know, Freaks Come Out at Night was also on this tape. So for whatever reason, that combination of songs, it just blew me away. And I was like, this is it, man. This is this what is I, it. I love this. Like, this yes. is amazing. I love the sound of it. I love the stories they were telling. I really loved the sound of scratching and I didn't understand anything about it at the time. I just liked how it sounded and yes. I didn't understand the construction of, you know, when UTFO, when it's Mixed Master Ice and all, I didn't know what that was right. other than it sounded cool yeah. and all that. And um, of course, as you know, in those songs in that era, you know, a lot of them had a lot of scratching Yeah, and that sound was something I wasn't familiar with, but it was a sound that I loved. And as you know, the 85 to really 89-ish was like the best, I would say, but to me that was like the most scratching and the best scratching on records, and it was like all the time. Uh, I, I'm with you on that. You know, I interviewed, uh, I had the, the, the pleasure of interviewing uh, uh, Lonzo, yeah. um, Violet Brown, and I asked them when hip hop first came out, um, you know, because obviously they were there and, you know, I was somewhat there, but they're a little bit older than me. Right. And these people, uh, uh, Violet and Lonzo, were either in the business or were, you know, contributing to the business as far as music is concerned. Um, one thing that they all said that everybody was saying, this is just a fad. Right. It, it, it's going to go away. Right. I remember my brothers used to always tell me that because I was bumping, you know, rap, and um, it's just a fad. Right. It's gonna go away. My, my mom, you know, my dad would all, all tell me, "Turn it down." You know, I can't wait till this is over. Type of deal. 
And it's taken over. Fast forward to 2020. Yeah, 2020, <laughs> and here we are talking about the history of gangster rap. We're going to get into this book after we take this uh, this 10-minute break, but let's press pause right there because I do want to ask you some very interesting questions that I saw on here, and I encourage everyone to get this book. At, at the very end, we'll tell everybody where they can go, where they can order it, and we're going to be giving away one book uh, here yeah. to a, a, a lucky subscriber. Okay, uh, we're going to be giving one away the history of a gangster rap. So call somebody, text somebody, slap the hell out of somebody. Let them know that Soren Baker is in the building and we'll be back with the history of gangster rap. What it do is Mr. Little One chilling on Rhodium Radio with the one and only Tony A and John motherfucking Elkin, boy. Hey, what up? It's your boy, Mr. Shadow. You're watching Rhodium Radio with my homeboy, Tony A, the wizard. You know what time it is. Yeah, what up? This is Mr. Night Owl, and you're listening to Rhodium Radio with the legendary Tony A, the motherfucking wizard. Yo, what's cracking? Nosotros somos Aqua. Estamos aquí con Tony A, the wizard. You know Rodium what it is. Radio, damn it. You know what it is. Yo, what up? This is Mellow Man Ace and Padrino, and you tuned in to Rodium Radio with my man Tony A. Keep it locked. Yo, what's cracking? It's your boy OG Arabian Prince from the world's most dangerous group, NWA. Sitting here with my boy Tony A, the wizard, on Rodium Radio. What's up? This is Esther Daz with Spanish Fly, Harbor Area's finest. Tune in to Tony A on Rhodium Radio. What's up, everybody? It's your homegirl, Magic Girl, and you are now listening to Rhodium Radio with Tony A, the Wizard. Yo, what's up? This is Bozo, a.k.a. Emiliano. You tune in to Rhodium Radio on Tony Vision's YouTube channel. Let's get it. What up, what up? This is Mr. Soto. You guys are now in tune to Rhodium Radio right here on Tony Vision on YouTube. Yep. Check it out. This is MC Poncho on the MIC. Shout out to Tony A, the Wizard, Rhodium Radio. You already know. What up, this is DJ Trick, Spanish Fly, and you're watching Tony A on the Rhodium Radio Show. Big G, Rhodium Radio, Tony A in full effect. Stay tuned, watch, listen. This is how we doing it over here. Yo, what up? I'm out here. It's Big Daddy Swoles. I'm jamming with my man, Tony A, the wizard, out here on Rhodium Radio. The podcast is off the hook. Check us out. This is DJ Clientel, and you are listening to Rhodium Radio with Tony A, the wizard. Yeah, 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 this baby bounce here with Tony A, the wizard. You are now tuned in to the Rhodium Radio. We do it for the people. You hear me? My check, my check. Ernie G from Proper Dos. And I'm listening to Tony A, the motherfucking wizard on Rhodium Radio. And if you don't know, you should know. Yo, this is Daniel Jones, the D to the motherfucking G Media Clips. Here with your boy. Tony A. The Wizard on the Rhodium Radio Show. Yo, what's up? This is John motherfucking Elkins, and you're tuning into Rhodium Radio with my homeboy, DJ Tony A. The Wizard. What up, West Coast and all hip-hop fans? This is your girl, Violet Brown, and I'm here with Tony A. The Wizard. And if you're rolling with us right now, that means that you love West Coast hip-hop. And if you want to know the real deal from the real players, the real people behind the scenes, you better pick up Tony's new film, Rhodium Mixtape Documixery. You get it by going to documixery.com. You better get this. And I want to do a special shout out and a rest in peace to my man, Steve Yano. I'm out. Everybody, this is Bill Duke, and uh, I'm holding my brother Soren's book. Please buy it. It gives you insight into the world 
a rap hip hop in the time and the characters of the many, many people who have made it happen. So it's a must read. God bless. Check it out. What's up, baby? You know what it is, Joe Tory. What do I have in my hand? The history against the rap. None other than Soren Baker can tell you better, baby. He was there. I was there. Best book out right now. If you ain't got it, go get it. Because this young man was right there. When he was 15, <laughs> he was on the scene. Soren Baker, baby. That's my boy. Go get this right now. One. So find the big boy, big boy's neighborhood, man. Look at this. The history of gangster rap. Soren Baker. I'm so glad you made it, my brother. For those who know it, you know it. For those who don't know it, pick up your copy, man, and study this beautiful thing that we call gangster rap and this beautiful thing that we call hip hop. Soren, love it. Hello. Hey, man. The history of gangster rap. Soren, bro. You the man for this one, dog. It's what we been needing. We been needing this, man. And I'm glad you did it first, dog. And I got mine. Ain't nobody getting this one. Mm -hmm. What's cracking, y'all? This is Dr. Green Thumb, aka B Real Cypress Hill Serial Killers, Prophets of Rage. Do you know how to read? Because if you do, boom! The History of Gangster Rap by Soren Baker. Go get it, or I'm gonna haunt your fucking dreams. What's up, y'all? It's Mr. X to the Z Exhibit. Yeah, I'm friends with Soren. We're friends, and, and my friend wrote a book. It's called The History of Gangster Rap. Go buy it on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Nobles. If you read books, a lot of people don't read books nowadays, but God bless them, you know. Soren, I love you, man. X to the Z, and we out. Yo, what's up, yo? This your main man, Schooly D. Get my man, Soren Baker's book, The History of Gangster Rap Worldwide. It's selling out. You better get it quick. Don't be a motherfucking dick. Yo, yo, what's up? It's your boy, OG Arabian Prince, World's Most Dangerous Group, NWA. Hey, my homeboy, Soren, you got a new book. You got to check this out right here. The History of Gangster Rap. Don't read. I've read it. I've checked it out. All the history of the West Coast gangster rap scene is in this book. You got to get it. Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, 24 hours a day. Go get this book. Peace. Hey, the history of gangster rap, man. I'm double cup out here with my MC. Soren Baker, man, one of the dopest writers, authors. This book is a must cop. It's not for just educational purposes, man. Just because this is a dope. Gangster rap, right. hip hop, music, artifact, right? It's a must cop. It's a must cop. So i Baker, man. West side, come on down, man. What's up? The one only mass ceremony, the great one, Dana Dane. It's official, y'all. The history of gangster rap, my man, Siren Baker. Y'all need to get this, man. You want to know anything about gangster rap? Where it came from? Who put it down? Where it's going? Where it's been? This is gangster rap, Siren Baker. Get yours. I got mine. Yeah. GLA double dollar sign east side. You already know. With the homie Soren Baker. I got the Bible against the rap. It's like the motherfucking Bible. Barnes and Noble. You know what I'm saying? Amazon. Get this. This is the. If you like gangster rap, this is the Bible. It's stories of gangster rap Jesus. Man. Me. <laughs> what it is, what it is, y'all. This should play a part of the legendary cocaine. And make sure you go pick this book up. By my brother Soren Baker. It's the history of gangster rap. Authentic, 100% true. Holla! What's up? It's your boy Mac 10. Make sure you check out my homeboy Soren Baker's book, The History of Gangster Rap. This shit right here is fire. Soren seen it all. <laughs> hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy James Savage. Formerly known as J.O. Felony. Y'all know what it is. Go check my dog out, man. Soren Baker, The History of Gangster Rap. It's out now everywhere. Amazon, y'all can go pick it up. You know what I'm saying? All the bookstores, y'all know what it is. Barnes and Nobles, all that shit. Go get my dog shit. I'm in there about two, three times, goddammit. It's on. Y'all know what it is.
Gangsta Rap. Go get it. The history. Sean Baker, West Coast. Yeah. Yo, what's up, y'all? It's Sir Jinx. I want you guys to check out the history of gangster rap by my homeboy, Soren Baker. You know what I'm saying? How we do it. Keep history in your life and you might be all right. Yo, welcome back everybody to Rodian Radio, and uh, my special guest today is the author of uh, The History of Gangster Rap. We're going to go ahead and jump right into it because there's so much that we want to cover. But before we actually start touching on this book, I want to ask you, uh, uh, who are some of your favorite rappers? You can Give me five, ten, whatever, no specific order. Okay. Just some of your favorites. Well, my favorite rapper is Schooly D. Okay. He's my favorite. He's my hero. He's the dude that I idolized in so many ways. And he's also the first rapper I remember when I was 12 thinking of if I ever get to meet people like I wonder if Schooly D's like he is on his record. I wonder if Schooly D's cool like he sounds. I wonder if he's as tough as he is. I wonder if he's like, you know, the dude that he says. Like I was just so curious about him. And, you know, so he's my favorite. Okay. Some of my other favorites, I think the best rappers, LL Cool J of all time, uh, Keras One, uh, Scarface, Ice Cube, Too Short. Uh, there's so many. Right, I mean, it's right. like hundreds that right, I could right. name that I think are like some of the best rappers. But the ones I just named, I think, are the ones that, you know, LL, Keras One, uh, Scarface, Ice Cube, Too Short. Master Ace is another one. I don't think it's enough credit that I think is phenomenal. So, but I could literally name you hundreds of guys. Of course, of course. Now, uh, I know at one point, either you worked for or wrote, I don't know if it's the same thing, you wrote for LA Times yes. and The Source Magazine. Yes. Which one was first or were they both at the same time? No, no. I started writing for The Source when I was in college. So that was uh, 95. Okay. I started writing for The Source, and then I started writing. I moved to L.A. in 98. I got a job at Rap Pages. Thank you to Alan Gordon for that. And then uh, I moved out here in 98 and worked for Rap Pages. And a couple months after I moved here, because at that point I had written for the Chicago Tribune for a while, and I'd written for the New York Times. So then when I got here, I reached out to the L.A. Times so many times. They're like, look, you have to really live here to write for us. So as soon as I got my feet set here in LA I just asked Alan my editor at Rap Pages I was like hey man is it cool if I reach out to them because you, you know I, I need to keep doing all my other stuff keep it active he's like yeah man just don't go get a job I was like no no I want to work at Rap Pages trust me so then it ended up working out that I got my uh, being able to write for the LA Times and then uh, Rap Pages folded I got a different job and then I started working full time for the source in 2003 but okay. so it's basically a year and a half or so when I worked for Rap Pages, I didn't write for the source. But basically from 95 till 2009, uh, when I didn't work for this, that's when I stopped working for the source. So basically that whole time, other than about two years, give or take, I wrote for the source as well. You ever talk to youngster today? And then when you mention the source, they go, what's that? Well, I don't really, you know, unless somebody asks me, I don't really just talk about stuff like that that right. I did. So, but I have noticed a couple of times when people ask me stuff and I mention that, they're like, oh, what's that? Or, oh, really? Yeah. But with a very confused look on their face. And that's the reason why I like to <laughs> single things out like that for <clears throat> this younger generation is because I forget, like, sometimes I'll use this term. You sound like a broken record. Right. And this generation, if they've never seen a record, they don't understand. They don't understand what that means. So I have to stop trying to use these, what, what we would call those idioms or something like yeah, that. Yeah, truisms, idioms. Yeah. Right. So um, I, I always have to kind of simplify things. So uh, he was referring to the Source magazine, which was a hip hop magazine uh, based out of New York, if I'm right. right. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, now let me ask you this, because since I don't know, and this is just to ask, uh, how was the money writing for newspapers? uh the money for newspapers unless you were on staff wasn't good but how i made up for it was volume 
Okay. So with the LA Times in particular, at the peak, I started in 98, and for the next couple years, I mean, I was in the newspaper at the minimum three times a week and up to eight or nine times a week, depending on what was happening at the time. But I wrote features, the long stories. You know, I did really big interviews with Snoop Dogg, for instance, in the LA Times. You know, I interviewed so many people. Uh, I did the first big story ever in the LA Times on Jamie Foxx um, the, for acting. But I'm just saying, I was interviewing a right. lot of big people and right. had the fortune of doing that. So, you know, but that was also always my side gig. I never was full-time staff at the LA Times. Okay. I always had a different job while I wrote for the LA Times, so it was supplemented by income. Okay. Uh, magazines, at least from my experience, being on staff and stuff, they paid better, but the LA Times, you have to think about it, a magazine at the time was coming out 12 times a year, whereas the LA Times came out 365 times a year. Right. So if I could get in the LA Times even 300 times, and there were years where I had more than that, it was more about the, you know, the exposure, getting, the opportunity and then on top of all that is that I love rap and I love doing what I was doing so it was like thankfully and fortunately I was able to make a living at it and still am knock on wood but it was more about this is something that I love to do and I literally when I was 10 11 and 12 formed this idea of being able to hang out with be with interact with the artists that I loved and admired and looked up to and I figured out a way to do it, and writing was how I did it. Awesome. And that's how and why, that's what drove me to be, you know, what I am and what I was. Like, I, uh, you know, I joke about it, but I'm a professional rap fan. Like, I get right. paid because I love rap, and I get to talk about it and listen to it and interact with the artists. And, you know, you, you're interviewing me. It's just amazing. Like, this is... You know, when I was a little kid and I would be listening to your stuff, like to fathom that I would a meet you and then you'd be interviewing me, being from Maryland, fantasizing, loving, studying, admiring all this, and to be here. And I know we're not in LA, but be in LA, and right. you know that that was a dream. And right. um, well, you know, thank you for coming, brother. You know, oh, it's, it's uh, an honor. Uh, yeah, I greatly appreciate you being here. Um, was there ever any people out of all the people that you've interviewed as far as rappers was there any of them that you might have like had up here and they disappointed you oh yeah that's happened many times uh well not many times a handful of times and uh the first time was when i was in college i interviewed a dude that i literally had his poster on the wall and when i interviewed him i was like this dude's really stupid and that hurt me because I knew rappers to be super intelligent. They had all these words and lyrics and rhymes. And, and some of them, like I knew, went to college. And some of them, like Chubb Rock's a merit scholar. Like these dudes are highly intelligent. Yes. And you can tell by their lyrics. Rakim is clearly super intelligent. Like yeah. when you read the lyrics or you listen to the lyrics and you hear them speak and the things they reference. So this dude that I interviewed, I was so crushed. Like, this dude is like, wow. Yeah. And then another guy that I interviewed, and these are both rappers that are from the 80s, that came out in the 80s, one of whom, the one I'm about to tell the story of, was like one of the biggest rappers of the era, and then the other one was definitely one of the biggest, but not on the level of the dude I'm about to tell the story. So I, went, I go to interview these dudes, and like, the one is just like causing a fight with me. like just With you? Yeah, just like challenging everything I said. I'm asking questions. He's asking me why I'm asking this question. And the other dude with us like, nah, man, I was with him. He knows what he's talking about. Just let him. He's like, he wasn't even going to ask you the question. You keep cutting him off. Let him ask his question. Right. So these dudes are like fighting among themselves about me. It was just, it was terrible. Wow. That was like, those are the only two that really stand out as if being like really really disheartening and really disappointing but as you know once you start to move into knowing people as people yes then it's a different level right. like that was just a journalistic i'm not hanging out with these guys i'm not knowing them i'm just interacting right. with them but as you know like 
you have a perception based on what people rap about or talk about or it, and even sing about or whatever, right. and then you get to know them and they're like, oh, that's not real. <laughs> or, oh. Right. So that's a different level of disappointment, but, you know, that's also, we have to remember, this is like entertainment. Right. So, you know, it's just different. Right. Now, uh, uh, let, let me touch on something that I believe possibly me and you have experienced. At least I have. Uh, I know that hip hop is a black industry, mm -hmm. predominantly black industry. Right. Even though Latinos have been in it from the very beginning, if you look at B Street, Style Wars, and movies like that. Um, I, I've been to, when I first started, because the majority of the times when I went to, like, either, whether it was Battle of the DJs, whether it was clubs, it was predominantly all black. Right. And sometimes I would be, if you will, the only white guy there, even though I'm Mexican, okay? <laughs> right, I was about to say. Uh, yeah, but, but you know, they, they would always right. say, like, what are you doing here? Or right. not, not the majority of them, but there were, you know, you did get kind of picked on like that. You know, you're Mexican. What do you know? Right. You know, did you ever get that? Like, uh, you're a white guy. What the hell do you know? Yeah, I mean, it still happens. Uh, as you know, in YouTube comments, you'll get that uh, more than anywhere else. But the funny thing was like in, in uh, where I grew up, people knew me because I grew up with them. Mm -hmm. And where I grew up, there's, you know, it's very racially diverse. So like, I, I didn't even understand what racism was because my parents aren't racist and didn't raise me in that environment. My neighbors were black. My parents had friends of all nationalities. We grew up in a very racially diverse area. And like, so it was weird. It wasn't until high school, really, that I understood like, more so that some people were like, hey man, I always I knew rap was black dominated, of course, but it wasn't until high school where then uh, I heard a couple little comments like, oh, what is Soren? He thinks he knows this or whatever. But literally, that was 1% of my experience. 99% right, right. my friends encouraged me. You know, we all went to shows together. It wasn't any of that with my actual friends. And then when I got to college is where it really hit me. Because in Ohio, at least in Cincinnati, no one knew me. So the white people thought I was trying to be black and the black people thought I was a fraud or, or a perpetrating or whatever. And I was trying to fit in or whatever they thought I was right, doing. Right. But the funny thing about that is, you know, then once they saw my articles in the source, everybody was my friend. Yeah. They then want to come sit with me in the cafeteria. Oh, Soren, I saw your article, man. Like, oh, what's coming? You know, I was like, really? Really? Yeah, really? exactly. You know, they're like, oh, you really do write for these big places. And I'm like, yeah, I do, you know, but okay. So that was weird. And it's happened, you know, once I got really more in the game, then it happened a couple of times. But in generally speaking, I've had, thankfully, a knock on wood, you know, not much of that. And I think a lot of the artists, they actually are taken aback or surprised because I'm white, because I'm from Maryland, and because I look like I look, I guess. People are always like just very impressed and surprised that I know right. so much and that I love it so much and that I, I'm here for the music. Like, I don't care who you messed with three girlfriends ago or who's your baby. Like, I don't care about that I'm, unless you talk about it in your music. Right. But if you're talking about A in your music, I don't care about your personal life or whatever unless it relates to your music. So I think that's really helped me. And, you know, people can tell if they actually talk to me and, like, know, interact with me, know me, and all that. Like, I love rap. Like, right. it's my favorite thing in the world. Like, yes. So I'm only here because I love rap. There's right. no other reason. So, no, same here. I love rap, of course, funk, you know, all of, <clears throat> all of the dope dope music you know it's funny because uh, quick story I, I was in junior high and uh i remember they were looking for a dj to play for the noon dances mm -hmm. and they put up flyers uh, uh, and what i did i went and i took them all down okay uh, I, because i wanted to be i wanted you to get wanted that to job be the DJ. yeah so and keep in mind we didn't have two turntables at the house my brother would take me to the club where he would DJ at, and before he would uh, start, they would open up the doors, he would let me practice for at least okay. a good hour. So I had two 1200s and a new mark. Wow. You know, yeah. so I, I'm, you know, I'm dropping needles and practicing. You're starting off with Bentleys right there. Yeah, <laughs> for, exactly. And uh, what happened was, I remember I talked to one of the deans over there who was in charge, and I said, I, I'm a DJ. That's all I, I kind of lied, you know. 
And he goes, oh, yeah, well, let me share my equipment. He had one turntable, cassette deck, and a mixer with a round fader. And I said, I'll do it. Uh, I, that's how I DJed. But here's the funny part. Up until that point, uh, to most of the popular kids at the junior high, I was a wetback. Hmm. You know, dumb wetback, what do you know? Stupid ass beaner, you know, good, go back, go back, you know, to right. your country or whatever. After my first noon dance, I had all O'Brien, I had the bar case, I had Zap, everything. After that, I was no longer a wetback. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny because when I heard the song The Vapors by Bismarcky, Bismarcky I yeah. understood it. Yeah, of course. You know. But yeah, I was no longer a webback. So, but anyway, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I graduated. <laughs> Thank you. So you know what? On here, uh, when I opened it up, by the way, this is a signed copy. Yes. Um, uh, the, the first person that, oh, well, actually, uh, the forward is given by Exhibit. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Exhibit, again, yes. as always, for holding me down. And you opened it up with Schooly D. Yes. Okay. Did you sit on one-on-one -on -one with him on this one? Not this one. I did it over the phone because he okay. was in Philly. But I've been to his house and hung out with him many, many times. For the people that saw the commercial where he's holding the book and shouting me out, right. I went to Philly after the book came out because... Uh, he drew or he had a drawing that he had never published or anything. And since I'm friends with Schooly, I just said, hey, man, I got this book coming out. Of course, I need to interview you. But do you also have any drawings? Because people that know Schooly D from, you know, the self-titled album or the Saturday Night, the album and, and that era, he drew all of his covers and stuff. So he, I, even the 12 inch of that. Part. Yeah. So I asked him, I was like, hey, man, do you have any artwork that's never been published from that era? He's like, oh, yeah. And he sent me one. Wow. So it's in the book. But um, Schooly, I've known him since 95. So mm -hmm. this time I didn't sit down with him, but I have okay. sat down with him a number of times over the years. Now, when you first met him, was he the guy on those songs? Here's the funny story about my first interaction with Schooly. So I've been listening to him, idolizing him, admiring him for so many things, which I detail extensively in the history of gangster yes. rap, a lot of his accomplishments and why he's so special. Mm -hmm. But... The thing is, when I was in college is when I interviewed him and I found out who his publicist was and I like was tracking this lady, hounding this lady, rap sheet, Billy Johnson Jr., thank you for this. But he gave me the first time to interview Schooly. So he's like, all right, you know, go ahead and interview him when you can interview him. So I'm at my parents' house. It's over the summer in college and the publicist calls me. Uh -huh. And uh, she's like, hey, Soren, how you doing? Da -da -da -da. She's like, oh, so do you still want to interview Schooly D? And I was like, of course. She's like, oh, he's available in two minutes. Can you do it now? And of course, this is my idol, my favorite rapper. Right. I, had, I was like cutting the grass or something. I wasn't like thinking about interviewing anybody. I was right. like, of course, I'll do it. Literally, dude, I talked to this dude for like three hours. Wow. Like just because since I was 10, 11, 12 years old, all these things I'd always thought about, wanted to talk to him about. And at the end of the interview... He said to me, he goes, man, you know, I don't like to do a lot of interviews. I don't really do a lot of interviews. He goes, but you really know a lot about me, man. I really appreciate you talking to me. That's awesome. And I was like, yo, Schooly D just said that to me. That's yeah. amazing. And of course, at the time, I'm like 21, 20 years old. So I'm like, so fast forward, next year, I'm going to the CMG, CMJ Music Seminar, mm -hmm. the new music seminar in New York. Okay. And I just go up there because I... There was some reason I was going up there because I knew there was stuff going on or whatever. But I took the train and um, I get there and I'm looking at the brochure. I went by myself and I'm looking through the brochure and I see Schooly D is going to be there. I had no idea. So I was like, oh, my God, I get to meet Schooly D. <laughs> so I go to the panel he was speaking at. And after the panel, I just waited till everybody was gone because I was like, I have to talk to him in person. Now, keep in mind, we had kept in touch a little bit here and there over the phone. He loved the article I wrote about him. So I just went up to him and I was like, yo, Schooly. He's like, hey, man, what's up? I was like, yo, it's Soren Baker, man. It's an honor to meet you. And he like looked around me and he looked back at me. He was like, you're Soren Baker? He's like, I thought you were some 50-year-old black man. He's like, how do you know all that stuff, man? And then he took me to lunch and we like ate late lunch and like hung out for like four hours just talking. That's dope. It was so amazing, man. And it was just like, this is like what I dreamt about. And then that was uh, 96. So in 97, this is the craziest thing, man. In 97, I pitched doing a story because he was DJing raves in Philadelphia. Wow. So I pitched Vibe. Vibe let me do the story. So I 
he was like, hey, man, like, what are you doing? And I was like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm doing a story. He goes, oh, well, I mean, are you still at your parents' house in Maryland? I was like, yeah. He goes, well, why don't you just drive up for, you know, drive up. We'll go to the, to the show, and then I got to do an after party, and then we'll just hang out all day. He's like, you want to do it? I was like, yeah. So I drove up, and literally, dude, it was 10 years after I said, I wish I could hang out with Schooly D, and like, I wonder what he's really like and all this. Wow. And he's inviting me to his house. I went to his house. He showed me all of his paintings from back in the day and stuff he was wow. working on then. We were driving around in his like old school car. Uh, we went to this rave. He DJed and rapped. And I was like literally as far away as we are, I was from him while he was DJing and rapping. And then I got to the after party and, and I met Code Money, his DJ, who like showed up. And that was the first time I'd met him. Dope. Uh, Cause Code, he, he had a different DJ when he traveled at the time, well, when he was in New York. But then, um, so it was just like literally 10 years later, wow. I had lived that part of my dream. Here and, we go. Mm -hmm. PSK, what does that mean? <laughs> people always say, what the hell does that mean? You know, it's funny because uh, I used to walk up to people and just ask them that playing around and nobody ever knew. Yeah. Nobody ever knew. You want to give it away? It's for the people that don't understand. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> Gotta go listen to a it. Man. Gotta go That's for to the it. way you scream and shout. One by one, I'm not knock you out. out. You Came know, for the way Tony A is cut. <laughs> there you That's go. That's the remix. The That's Tony dope. A remix. You no, know, I'm gonna tell you who was a big fan. Of, I'm sure he still is. Uh, Dr. Dre. If you listen to Matter of Fact, '86 in the mix. Uh, yeah, '86 in the mix. He used that uh, uh, one by one. Uh, knock knock you, you out. out. Yeah. He he cut that because he was talking about people stealing our tapes and shit, bootlegging them. Right. And he goes, and if I catch you do it, yo ass is mine. You know, he would do a lot of those cuts. So yeah, yeah. yes, I grew up listening to him. Uh, I noticed that in the book you have a timeline of rap, like '85. You have LL, Dougie Fresh, PSK, which I thought was dope. Uh, you even put president at the time was uh, Ronald Reagan. Right. So not only are they being educated as far as history of rap, uh, but also history of what was going on during that time. Yeah. And I, I really, I really like that. And Thank what, I, what I really enjoyed too was the little like uh, uh, either their cassettes or little album covers that you have. Like right, right. here we have Mix Master Spade and Toddy T, uh, Gangsta Boogie, the little cassette. So you get it like this. And um, I think it's really, really dope the way you did it because I, um, for me, it's very, very educational. Now, uh, even though the book answers it, but I'm going to ask you for the public's sake. Okay. Uh, um, would you credit Schooly D as the founding father, if you will, of gangster rap? I do because, okay. you know, when PSK came out in 85, but in 84, he had like Gangster Boogie song. Then PSK came out, but, you know, as I talk about in detail with my book, like, there's, you know, street rap, reality rap, all these different things. Right. But the difference was Schooly D, PSK, stood for Parkside Killers, his gang that he was in or affiliated with, however you guys want to look at it. But also, you know, in Parkside 5-2, which came out in 1986, which ended up being on his uh, Saturday Night album. You know, he said, Parkside, my place and home. The PSK gangsters like the Rome. Cheaper in our hand, 32 in our socks, protecting our turf like it was Fort Knox. That's gangbang. Yeah, yeah. This is my neighborhood. This is my corner. This is my street. I got a gun. I'm smoking weed. And if you come on your, our block, we got you. Right. Now, that's gangbanging. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> that yeah. is what it no. is. Uh. And he did that in 86. So, you know, when we look at, and Schooly D sounded angry. He sounded upset. He sounded, you know, violent and menacing and all these things we associate with gang, like gangs and gang banging. And one of the things that a lot of the L.A. rappers of that era weren't doing that. Right. Or not. Right. Uh, none of them were doing it. The ones that did talk about the streets like Melly Mel. And I talk about this in detail in the book. But the difference that Schooly D did was a lot of the rappers rapped about things in the third person. So they were rapping about what they saw. Right. Scooby D was rapping about, I'm the one doing it. I'm the menace. I'm the gangbanger. I'm the menace of society. You know, and that changed it because that influenced Ice T. That influenced King T. That influenced all these guys, Easy E, Ice Cube, everybody. And, you know, as you mentioned with Dr. Dre, but you hear it in the raps that 
you have the three main pillars of this, of what we know today, and what is gangster rap, is you have PSK, what does it mean in 1985 by Squiddy, you have Six in the Morning by Ice-T in 86, which follows it, and then the next one is Boys in the Hood by Eazy-E in 87. Those are the three, and if you listen to them in order, you will hear how directly, and Ice-T told me this, Ice-T has talked about it, but it's in detail in my book, that Ice-T heard PSK and was like, wait a minute, like he's rapping about a gang and he's rapping about street stuff in a way that I could but I didn't think there was an audience for that and that inspired six in the morning and it's clear like you said sonically and all these different things that they took from Schooly D you know he is the direct forefather mm -hmm. of all of this and you know as well as being a DJ how many people hundreds of people have sampled PSK yeah. Hundreds of people, or maybe dozens, have sampled Gucci Time. Yeah, these are these are songs that the people that you admire have sampled, love, cherish. Whether it's Dr. Dre, whether it's Puffy, whether it's all these people that changed music, they look at PSK, DJ Premier, the Alcoholics. I could go on and on and on and yeah. on. All these people have sampled Schooly D, Nicki Minaj. You know, it's not just the dudes that came out in the 80s or the 90s. Nicki Minaj is using the PSK flow on Bees in the Trap. Jay-Z redid PSK, you know. Puffy I think Biggie did. Eve, even... Biggie did it uh, on the Life After Death album. It's the B.I.G. interlude, for those that don't know. Yeah. If you have the Life After Death album, listen to that. Well, listen to B.I.G. interlude mm -hmm. and then go back and listen to PSK, What Does It Mean? And it's, but you know, it's literally a cover. He right. just does the same song. Again. Right. Well, you know what? You, you documented it very well here because other than this book. And that's the picture right there. That yes. Schooly gave, gave me. That's exclusive to my book. Uh, um, you guys can get it. History of Gangster Rap book. Um, well, other than yourself covering it here, the only other time that I've ever heard anybody talk about Schooly D was... Um, uh, Hip Hop Evolution, if I'm correct, on Netflix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other other than you two are the only ones, yeah. you know, that, that have that have covered it very very well. Uh, um, well thank you. And, and I'm thankful that you are educating people through through this book. Uh, now, the first time, and I, I know you touched on it a little bit. You said reality rap, street rap, or whatever. It's it, it's funny because the first time that I ever heard somebody refer to as hip hop as street rap or gangster shit. It was to, it's like that. Hmm. It, it, it's weird. It, not that they were claiming to be smoking weed and banging, but what it was, I remember being at a club and uh, it was all Crip Club in, in the city of Long Beach on the east side called Grand Central Station. Yes. And uh, what happened was when that kicked in, boom, 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 right. bam, tsh, boom, everybody starts throwing up their seas. Okay. And then I remember hearing this one dude, he must have been drunk as fuck or something because he was like, this is just some gangster shit. And that was the first time that I ever re heard somebody refer to music. As gangster. Yeah. Huh. Not, not, not that I think they were saying that Run DMC was gangster, but it was more of, of the beat and what they were saying they were able to It's the feeling. To. Yes. Yeah, it's the feeling. It's the feeling. Uh, uh, after that, uh, uh, again, the... the other stuff that I've heard, obviously, was PSK, Ice T. We can go down the line, and when you covered it very well here, uh, King T. I thought he had a dope uh, album cover, the Act the Fool <laughs> album cover. That shit was hard. Yeah. You know, I even told my boy, I said, I think that cover was harder than his lyrics in the album. <laughs> it you know, was. Since, you know, I mean, uh, of course, a shotgun down the street. Yes, that'll, that'll do it. In yeah. Eighty-eight on yeah. top of that. Uh, Battle Ram, of course, Just Say No. We can continue to go down the line. I was a huge fan of Mixed Master Spade, you know, his singing style. Right. Uh, I used to cut up the beat on the two yeah. turns. I mean, who didn't sing that shit, <laughs> right, you know? Right, right, right. That, that was dope. Last night, I, I was at a club. I got invited uh, uh, to go to this club with me and my, my, my good friend, MC Pancho. Uh, much love and respect for him for inviting me to a place called Scam and Jam. It's held at the Regent in downtown LA. They do it once a month. And it's just pure old school, just okay. all old school. You won't hear nothing new. And so I went with my, my other homie, uh, Big Daddy Swoles, and uh, they're playing freestyle, they're playing disco, and then all of a sudden, the, nothing but girl DJs. They throw in, uh, woke up quick at about, about noon. <laughs> Dude, let me tell you something. That crowd went insane, okay? Right. The entire crowd starts singing all of them lyrics, okay? Other than maybe a Boys in the Hood, 
what song or what gangster shit, if you will, can you recall that you could just throw in and immediately the people will start singing? Man, that's a tough question because, you know, I'm from Maryland. So the first times that I really remember that happening were those is really the songs from Straight Outta Compton or the songs from Easy Does It. Yeah. Um, because for us, I was obviously, or I would imagine people could understand, like I was way more into rap than anyone else around me. And I still am in general. But, you know, the people, I grew up in Maryland, which is on the East Coast. So in generally speaking, most of my friends like East Coast rap new york rap more than they liked the west coast rap whereas i loved everything just because when i was introduced to it all the sounds and styles i had no idea where everybody was from unless they said a part of new york that i knew was in new york like i had no idea right. queens was in new york i didn't i knew brooklyn was but i didn't know all these neighborhoods or anything in new york so i just grew up listening to it all but the time that i really remember it changed to where it became like the white kids or the different things was really with the chronic okay that to me i was you know studying above the law and king t and uh, as everybody i detail in my book so i listen to everything right but i could tell the even though the music that was on the chronic had been used done in similar different ways you know by above the law even by dre himself you know, using the samples in different ways. Right. Um, you know, MC Breed. It had been done, EPMD, all kinds of examples, X-Clan. But the point is, it was something about uh, those songs on The Chronic that the people that weren't really into rap or knew about rap or whatever, for whatever reason, those people loved those singles. Yeah. And that changed it to where that was like universal stuff in a way that you know even i would argue like run mc was still too early for people that weren't in the rap. right like they might have liked uh walk this way but they might not have liked whose house or something right. you know other big run mc songs that came after that they you know it just didn't resonate with them in the same way so for my area it was more of the super hardcore stuff it would have been like the chronic era like okay that stuff. okay we're gonna go ahead and uh press pause right there we're gonna come back because i know you uh, i want to touch on something here because you actually touched on uh the rhodium swamp meat yeah. uh, mixtapes so he actually included the rhodium swamp meat here and he has a, a a quote here from quick we'll come back to that i got some more interesting questions concerning your book concerning gangster rap so once again everybody will be back we're gonna take a 10 minute break uh 25 dollars on the super chat and i'll mail these out to you uh the other ones have already went out so you should receive them sometime this week but uh once again uh four cds for 25 bucks or you can go to the website and there's a donate button and you can get 25 bucks or more and uh uh, uh Give us your address, your name, or whatever, and we'll send these out. So if you don't hit us on the super chat, you can hit us on the website, and we're, we're going to let you guys know how you somebody, some lucky person is going to win this book, uh, um, a subscriber. And once again, if, if you haven't subscribed and you're watching, I encourage you to subscribe because I'm going to go. I'm on a mission right now that I want to try to at least get ten thousand subscribers by the end of February. We're almost at eight thousand, and we our first show was on September eleventh of two thousand nineteen. We've only been on for about four months, and it's grown in a short amount of time. So. Uh, but help me achieve that. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and hit the bell notification button for future content. So once again, call somebody, take somebody, pay somebody, slap the hell, of, slap the hell out of somebody. Go grab a beer, and we'll be back in ten minutes with Soren Baker, the history of gangster rap.
get dumb at the rodeo with the funky drum And you know my man Steve can get some With a fool like Tony A when he plays stupid dope shit by W.A. You wanna spray? Dumb motherfuckers, no doubt And suck a DJ Get the fuck out! Tony A! What did you say your name? What did you say your name? Tony A! of a master plan. A rodeo mixtape to me was something that was made just for the road and you wouldn't hear it anywhere else and they would do raps on those tapes that were nowhere else you know what i'm saying and they were truly the first mixtapes that we ever heard you know and they would shout the rhodium out and you could kind of tell it was like someone's garage maybe the little echo you know what i mean it wasn't completely perfect and polished yet but that was the beauty of it that it was so raw that we could feel that shit. and i would just play them shits and draw that was my inspiration, my motivation to draw. So I always had to have some type of music. You know, if it wasn't the dynamic superiors or the temperies or some funk playing, it was, you know, second to none. It was it was quick. It, it was the penthouse players, you know, high C. And Tony G was at that time was like a god too. You know what I'm saying? He was out there DJing Latin freestyle parties and all the girls had their head hairspray like a lion and shit and hickeys on their neck and man pushing strollers and we'd be like ooh look at look at you know these parties at la casa and shit you know what i'm saying in downtown and mini trucks and beds were folded in the air like transformers and shit in the boulevard coming up and changing and flipping and subwoofers beating before the person even hit the corner you get goosebumps like damn and Elko would bend the corner on Dayton's and you were like, ooh, that fool strapped right there. That fool gotta be strapped. Motherfucker had candy ribbons, little willy f ribbons, ribbons from Compton on the side of his shit. Jerry Curl dripping all over his shit. Bent over to the side, bumping that fucking rhodium shit. And he had a tape that only came from right there. And if you didn't know about that place, or you didn't live in that area, you didn't have that shit. So that's kind of one up that the harbor area had on a lot of other people compton was next door but that that, that harbor area was ended in gardena you know what i'm saying so man those are great times man a rhodium mixtape is like a kilo of cocaine it's like a kilo of amigo potter you get that shit, you cut that motherfucker open and you put it in your motherfucking cd player and you start listening and you be like that's dope shit, this is dope how you do that, but really, a uh, 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 rhodium mixtape, bro, if you haven't experienced it and you was in hip hop back then, you I don't know what the hell you was doing. You done fucked up. A rhodium mixtape is like, it's a kilo of, uh, of cocaine. Music wise, I'm saying, motherfucker. <laughs> man, that's a little tough, but I'll tell you what, a ro it, it was the best thing ever for me, man. It was just kind of like something you never heard about. And especially West Coast was not getting that shine at the time, you know? So you would go to this place and they would make a custom tape, like, you know, and not knowing what it was, it was just the sound that came out of those tapes that, I, if I'm if I'm correct, you'd, you'd have to like, I would be feeling for those things if it was monthly, if not sometimes bi-monthly, but uh, a tape, it was just a mixture of the latest songs all mixed together. But the intro had like this crazy mix that I, I at the time, I be, like I believe that it was like four turntables at the same time, but I, I was like, how the hell are they doing this? Like, was it Superman behind the turntables or something like that? But a mixtape was a real mixtape. It was actually a cassette too, you know, just for, for the record. Yo, welcome back everybody to Rodian Radio with Soren Baker. Once again, uh, we're gonna jump right into it. We, there's so much uh, that we have to cover. Uh, on the screen, you see rodianradio at gmail.com. So for the one who's gonna win the book, uh, 
Here's how you're going to do it. Um, we are going to um, ask you a question. You go to rodeoradio at gmail.com and answer. And the first one who answers it will get the book. Uh, uh, we'll notify you, send us your address, your name, and we'll send that out to you completely free. And the question is this. What movie was Schooly D famous for? I hope I'm presenting it right for uh, implementing a lot of his music. Is, is that correct? Yeah, it's what movie featured a lot of Schooly D's music in it that he got famous for and got known for doing music and films. Yes, yes. So if you know the movie, go to rodeoradio at gmail.com. Uh, give us the name and the first person who answers it correctly will contact you and will uh, ship you out this um, awesome, awesome book, The History of Gangster Rap. So now uh, I had an interesting question before we get into the rodeo uh, mixtape uh, that, uh, that that you covered in, in your book. Did you ever run into any East Coast cats or any West Coast cats? Mostly East Coast because when Gangster Rap really started taking off, I would hear a lot of comments, whether it was in magazines or um, just people on the streets talking about <clears throat> that the West Coast or the West Coast Gangster Rappers ruined hip hop for oh yeah i heard that all the time okay can you elaborate a little bit more when was it that you first heard of it and was it mostly all east coast cats that were saying that yeah it was really even before i got into really writing i started noticing it in the magazines the bias that they had really just of anything not from new york but interestingly and i talk about this at length in the history of gangster rap the first time I really remember hearing about this bias was Do It Like a Geo in 1989 with the Ghetto Boys. Mm -hmm. Willie D was like, East Coast ain't playing my song. I want to know what the hell is going on. So right there, I was like, whoa. Like, I knew my friends liked certain stuff more than I did or less than I did or whatever. But for Willie D to have said that in 89, it was like really surprising to me. And it just took me aback. And then... You know, when I would read magazines, I could tell like, oh, this album I thought was phenomenal. Like Above the Law, I thought was one of the best rap groups ever. And they didn't get well received in the source. Or this artist that was from the South, they dissed them. And I thought it was a great album. So I started noticing that type of stuff. And then that fuels into the fact that, as I also show in my book, like people also, I'm really only about the art and what I like. But the justification is a lot of times, well, what sold more, what was more popular, what have you. And the irony is, is a lot of the magazines would justify things off of sales. But like the rappers from the West in particular outsold everybody else for a long time. They were way more popular sales wise. And that to me showed, okay it's you just don't like this music or there's something about it you're not a fan of or whatever and you're not being honest with yourself or the reader to where you're you know prejudiced against it or you're discriminating against it for whatever reason but like clearly if a million people bought quick is the name and thought it's a great album then clearly there's a fan base there and he deserves more than a half a page in your magazine if you're a rap magazine like, this is not a New York rap magazine. This is a rap magazine. And when I understood that, it really bothered me. But then I was like, okay, well, that's what it is. So I heard, saw, understood all this stuff going right. on quite a bit. And that's why you get the famous thing with Andre 3000 at the Source Awards. Says the South's got something to say. Snoop Dogg saying, what, you ain't got love for Snoop Dogg and Death Row? Like, it's because these artists that were, Death Row sold double, triple the number of records that Bad Boy did, but you would think they were neck and neck. Right. They weren't. Like, Snoop, you got, like, at the time, you know, you got to understand, like, Biggie, Craig Mack went gold, and Biggie was, like, double platinum. Dr. Dre had sold four or five million at the time with The Chronic, and Snoop sold more than Dre. So that's it, yeah. Period. And then they came back with Murder is the Case, a double platinum soundtrack. Like, it's not even an artist, it's a soundtrack. Right. So there's not even, they're not even in the same worlds sales wise. But if you're watching 
the video shows or looking at the magazines or what have you, you would have thought that Bad Boy was as big as Death Row. That's very and they true. and they weren't. Not even close. Just like, you know, and this is just, you know, factual information. Like I remember growing up, like Big Daddy Kane at the time was one of my favorite rappers, this, this, and this. And I remember they were talking about since he and Ice T were both on uh, Warner Brothers affiliated labels with Big Daddy Kane on Cold Chill and an Ice T on Sire, that Big Daddy Kane got way more coverage in the rap magazines than Ice T did. So I thought they sold around the same amount of records, but they didn't. Ice T sold way more records than Big Daddy Kane. Ice T had a platinum album with Power. Big Daddy Kane never had a platinum album. Ice T's first five albums went gold. Big Daddy Kane. Allegedly, he has two albums that won gold, but for sure one. But the other one, I can't really find on RIAA. But I believe the first two Big Daddy Kane won gold. Ice T, gold, platinum, gold, gold, gold. Big Daddy Kane, gold, gold, never gold again. That doesn't diminish Big Daddy Kane as a phenomenal rapper and somebody whose work I idolize and think. I'm just saying, purely from a sales perspective and purely from a coverage perspective in the media, you would think that he was bigger based on his popularity in the media versus Ice-T when Ice-T was selling five times as many records. You know, you know, there was a time, and I know we're touching on it, where East Coast just wouldn't touch West Coast. They wouldn't play him, yeah. play us at all. And I have good friends, much love and respect to them, that will deny that. No, we always showed you no, guys they, love. They say that now, but I live there, I know, I was, going to clubs in Baltimore and in DC and then when I started working in the in college in New York when I would be in New York and no it's 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 revisionist history they act like they supported the music and they loved all these guys no they didn't they didn't I was actually there and I was listening to the music I was in the clubs they did not play they didn't even play Snoop and they didn't play Death Row right they didn't Right. I was there. So unless I missed that half hour of the mix or something, <laughs> like, no, no, they didn't right. do it. I know. And, 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 and they deny it. And I, I, I love my homies. But So these dudes are telling you they played Compton's Most Wanted they, they, or Above the Law? Oh, we played or everything. No, we played no. quick. We played everybody. No, they did. And I'm like, and, and I'm cruising in the streets of Harlem with him. You know, and he, no, we did, we did. And I'm like, bro, I love maybe you. Maybe in your car. Maybe, exactly. Maybe. Yeah, but they, they you know. I know it didn't. Uh, um, there's a. Uh, I just want to touch a little bit on something. Could you put uh, here the Rotom Open Air Swamp Meet, aka the ro uh, the Open Air uh, Market, aka the Rodeo Swamp Meet. Okay, and then you touched on a 15 acre outdoor swamp meet in Torrance, California. The Rodeo Open Air Market is located six miles west of down downtown Compton, and was a place where independent rap artists gained uh, traction traction in the area by selling their music. Several gangster rappers became local celebrities in the mid 80s by selling their material at the flea market. Uh, and then it goes on to say, I think it's a quote from Quick. It says, I don't think I'd be in the music business had, not, had I not heard these mixtapes at the Rhodium Swap Meet. DJ Quick uh, uh, said that. Okay. Um, I'm going to quote Mr. Cartoon from the Rhodium Mixtape documentary. This is Mr. Cartoon's opinion. That's all he said. It's my opinion. In my opinion, the Rhodium mixtapes uh, formed gangster rap. That's what he said. Arabian Prince on the Rhodium mixtape documentary said the same thing. He said the NWA music hit the Rhodium Swami mixtapes first. Now, I'm not saying that gangster rap was started or created at the Rhodium Swami. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that I do believe that it was a huge contribution or a cornerstone to West Coast hip hop in, in general. Because people often ask me, do you think, you know, that hip hop started at the Rhodium? I never said that, okay? <laughs> I'm not saying that at all. Right. But I am saying that it, it played a major, major role with Steve Yano uh, slanging these tapes. I, I don't think he ever knew how big it, it would get where people, uh, uh, um, like you said, you heard about him in, in Maryland. I did. Point. And that's the thing that people... You know, it's hard, like they say in sports, it's hard to compare errors because so much changes with the rules and the style and how players are using all this stuff. But we have to also think about 
the rodeo. I never went to it. I only heard about it. I somehow the tapes got to me in Maryland. I don't remember even how, but my friends had them. The, I guess their relatives sent them or whatever. That's how I first heard of you. So when I knew when I got the Scandalous album, that's where I put the connection. Right. So that's how I knew who you were to be excited to hear Scandalous. But I say that to say people have to understand in this era in the mid 80s the getting into the mid to late 80s like out here there was k-day but it wasn't what k-day became yet really and then on top of that there was no videos right. there was other than k-day which from everyone everyone's ever told me the reception was spotty Terrible. you couldn't get it all the place whatever but it did have a huge impact so there's no videos the record stores people have to understand you went to the record store but with all of the artists that were at the rhodium none of them at the time had major label deals so they weren't going to be in the average record store they might have been in certain hood ones right. or ones that you know easy or lonzo or whoever because of world-class record crew success might have been able to get in or maybe consignment or whatever but these records were not played and they were not known so then you have a captive audience of rap fans of the culture fans of all this stuff and they're being able to hear something they can't hear anywhere else and there's millions of people in la and however many people over just say a year go to rhodium right you have a captive audience listening to the music that they can't hear anywhere else and they already are probably predisposed to like rap Right. And now they're hearing from their neighborhood, from their area, and it sounds great and it's phenomenal. That, of course, is going to help sell it. So you have K-Day, you have Macola Records, and then you have Rhodium. These three things, they all had to work in synergy because records are only going to be successful if they're heard. You know, Records are only going to be successful if they're available. So Macola has to be there, Rhodium has to be there, K-Day has to be there, and of course, first and foremost, you need the artists, and then you need the fans. Right. But right. everything in the world will only be successful if people know about it. Right. And one of the main ways from everything I know and from what people like you have told me, DJ Quick, who spoke to me extensively in the book, um, yeah, I mean, the exposure, hearing it, like if you're just outside and you're hearing a song like that m makes a difference on yes, you. yes especially if you're a teenager like oh my god what is this that's how i felt but i heard it on a cassette first that's what got me to want to buy listen get everything i could with rap right and right. that's you know people because the time and the era is so different now and music is just everywhere and you can listen to it on your phone you can listen to it in your car you can see it on television like we didn't have it like that it was right. a it was hard it was hard yes you know and especially rap you know you couldn't just turn on now you can hear rap you know just looking at la you can hear rap on six or seven channels probably on the radio yeah. at any time of the day yeah. when you and i were growing up you were k-day but me in maryland like as time went on because i was right in between baltimore and washington there were like six stations that played rap but one played it on Wednesdays from 7 to 9. I had a whole little grid. Right, of, right. Like, we had AM in Baltimore and FM in Baltimore. We had AM in DC and FM in DC. And I knew which one played it at which time on which day so I could tape it. And then, like, I'm sure you guys don't have thunderstorms out here, but I remember you got to chill with EPMD the first time I heard it on the <laughs> radio. It was on, a, it was on WBAL, the Baltimore AM station. And it was during a thunderstorm, and it went out because the signal died during the, the lightning. Wow. So I knew the I had memorized all the lyrics except this, like, three seconds where it went out, where the thunder went, and the lightning and the thunder was. So I knew the whole song except, like, this one little spot. Right, right. Because the power went out, or the, the signal was lost. Funny you bring that song up because the first time that I ever had that 12-inch was a test pressing. Oh, wow. Steve Viano used to get a lot of test pressings. He gave me a bunch of Easy e uh, test presses, Easy e uh, instrumental albums. Wow. A and um, what happened, he comes to my house, and he always gave me two. This one's going to be big. Okay, and I was like, hmm. And I remember one of the first times, it was EPMD, it's it's my thing. I think yeah, it's it was, your okay, it's, it's your thing. thing. I remember when I put, when I saw EPMD, I was trying to pronounce it, it. <laughs> right. And he was like EPMD, it's and I was like, thing. 
Okay. So when I played, you got to shield, shield, and that more bounce kicked in, bro. Right. I said it's over. Well, look at the seven minutes of funk, and it's my thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how many people use that sample? Right. Right. You know? Right. The alcoholics did. Jay Z did. So many people. Yeah. Did. Drew you're, down. You're, you're right. Drew down. You're used right. It. How How long did it take you to complete this book? To put it together. Uh, the funny thing about it is that's really my life. Okay. Or a huge part of my life. The 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 reality is it took me about a year to write it but right. most of that time is spent chasing down the artist to get him on the phone or right. to sit down and interview him in person or what have you the actual writing didn't take me very long because i've been writing you know all the time since basically 94. so writing knock on wood and thankfully has always been an easy process for me but i wanted to make my book very different in the sense that the history of gangster rap book i wanted it to be to where these were my interviews that i did for this book okay so when i talk to dj quick or when i talk to mc ren or when i talk to mc8 or when i talk to schoolie d or when i talk to exhibit or a game or whoever i ended up talking to or cj mac whatever i wanted it to be for my book so when i talk to the doc whatever the doc told me was not no one's going to find that anywhere else okay and that's why I did it the way that I did it because I didn't want somebody like a lot of books are just done by, you know, this is what Snoop said 17 years ago or whatever. I was like, well, I can get to Snoop. I know Snoop. I'm friends with Snoop. Snoop will talk to me for this book. And so I asked him stuff I'd always wanted to ask him that never made sense for an article or that I thought was important for this book. And yes. like you said, I have with the Rhodium sidebar or the Mixmaster Spade sidebar. There's sidebars with the DOC that I have where I asked him about writing for himself and writing for Snoop and the similarities and differences and writing with Snoop. And, you know, I wanted my book to have information that is very important to the story, but that hadn't really been told. Right. So right. that's why it took me around a year to write it. But the actual time of the writing you know, not right. very long. Okay, okay. Uh, now, I had another question that's pretty interesting. I don't know if anybody's ever asked you, because like I said, I'm only like <clears throat> halfway. But I wanted to ask you something about gangster rap. And uh, is Chicano rap at all mentioned in this book? And if not, why? Interesting you asked that. I have uh, not much about it in there because... Of a variety of reasons primarily the guys that i wanted to interview for the book i couldn't get or they didn't hit me back or what have you okay so that being said uh i didn't know you at the time when i was doing it and i had to rhodium in there anyway had right. i known you i'd have been happy clearly to interview you and talk about rhodium and all that because that's how i knew of you first right and i knew that, that those tapes that you guys did help spread gangster rap in a way that was integral to the popularity of it so like cypress hill for instance i know be real i know mugs i don't really know send dog like that even though i've met him several times over the years but every time i happen to hit be real he's like oh man i'm in columbia the country so he's wow. like i'm doing a show man i'll hit you when i get back and then i don't hear from him for two weeks and then i'm like oh man then i hit him up he's like oh man i'm in brazil and I'll see it. He really was. Right, right. So I just missed him. But I've interviewed Be Real like 15 times over the years. So right. I just didn't, unfortunately, I didn't get the guys that I really would have wanted that I think are of the magnitude of the other artists that I really focused on. I didn't, unfortunately, get the opportunity. So I mentioned extensively Cypress Hill and explained their right. importance. You know, even though this is later and a little bit different, I kind of put in the context about Fat Joe. So I tried to do that to the degree that I could of the artists that I thought warranted extensive discussion in the book. Okay. The reason why I asked, well, well I, obviously you couldn't get in contact with some of these guys. And I'll be honest, I've had the same problem here. Okay. Uh, I, I've had some of these guys that have contacted me. I want to interview I get the ball rolling. 
Here's my email. Send me two pictures. I text them. I text them. I text them. I text them. They don't return back a text messages anymore. They're too busy. They're on the set somewhere filming a movie. I'll get back to you in a couple of weeks. That type of crap. And I, I, I get upset at that. Right. Okay. Other guys that I reach out because fans want to see them. And man, I would like to get an interview with you. You know, without dropping names. But one day I will. Uh, um, <laughs> and they're like, uh, well, you know, I'm not really interested. And the fans want them. Of course. So, so you know, it's not really because I want their goofy ass here. My whole thing <laughs> is that I want to get them for the fans. And they're like, oh, well, here's an email. Just give me your number, dude. I'll call you. Right. You know, I really want to say sometimes, Warren, but I don't. Okay, because I was raised to be a humble and a modest person, but sometimes I do speak my damn mind. I really want to say, look, dude, I've been in this business for a long time, and I've dealt with a lot of big, big wigs. I was signed to one of the biggest record labels in the world. I've known Dre from the very beginning, okay? You're nowhere near on that level. Right. I really want to say that sometimes, but you know what? I don't. I okay. just bite my tongue, and I just say, look, okay, cool. If you're going to lower me down to an email, we're good, homie. I'll give you my number. I'm right. going to give you my address, right? you know, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe they're Hollywood now. I, I don't know, but that's the issue that I've been having with a lot of Chicano rappers. Right. Now, it's funny that Quick gave you this quote on the rodeo. Right. Because when we were doing this, he was the first guy I asked. Mm -hmm. And he cut me off and told me no. <laughs> people, so there it is. That's your answer because people have asked me. Uh, it's quick on the documentary. I never addressed it. Uh, um, so I thought it was kind of funny that he quoted the rhodium because I really, you know, he was, he was on my mixtape. I really, really wanted him on here. But before I can actually even finish, he just told me no. Right. I respected that. Cool. You have your reasons. No hard feelings. That's why I won't ask him to be on this show uh, because he had told me no to pay homage to somebody who had already had passed away and who sold his records. Right. So we're good. But uh, <laughs> anyways, I had to get that out. Gotcha. Uh, but uh, anyways, other than that, um, is there uh, any other books in the works right now? Yes. I have uh, one book that I've signed my deal for, but I have to keep it under wraps a little bit longer. Right, right. And then I have another one that if all goes well, in the next week or two, I'm going to have a signed deal for that one. Uh, so awesome. I'm, I'm very, very excited about these. They're very different from this book. So, you know, I'm excited to have different things because, you know, my friends that grew up with me in Maryland and the people that know me really well, they know that I love basically all rap equally. Yes. So while gangster rap I love and it is one of my favorite things ever and it is basically almost all many of my a lot of my favorite artists like i love like i said ll cool j is phenomenal to me there's yes. so, so many artists that are not gangster rappers mm -hmm. that i hold in the utmost uh esteem so i'm excited that you know people will be able to see that and that's something i do on my unique access channel yes. that i have like of course i love gangster rap and i cover that extensively because i think it's very important music and i you know I think do a great job of explaining that in my book and why it's so important. But on my channel, you know, I interviewed Dana Dane, I interviewed Talib Kweli, I interviewed Big Daddy Kane. I've interviewed, you know, so many people that are not gangster rappers. Right. Because Tony A. Tony A. <laughs> not a gangster rapper. Right. But I do that because I love all rap. Yes. And I don't want to. I want to be ultimately the number one destination for somebody that wants to learn about rap. Awesome. Regardless of what that is, whether it's new music, whether that's old music. I got Jeep Rico, who's like a rising gangster rapper from L.A., but I like his music. And he's, you know, out now. He's on Rock Nation. He's building a career. My son likes his stuff. My son teaches me a lot about rappers, believe it or not, because sometimes I'm very hard-headed. <laughs> and, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'll be like, oh, fuck that dude. And he was yeah. like, no, dad, you got to listen to this guy. Right, right. You know, but he told me about him, Jeep Rico. Yeah. Uh, um, I had a... Uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. um, I know you know rap. I, I know you know rap. I know you like beats. I know you like gangster rap. Like you say, you love rap equally. Do do you have you ever thought about dabbling in uh, maybe production? Well, what I really want to do, if the stars aligned, I really want to like A and R, or I know that's a lost art, but I really want to help an artist 
bring out what the best in them is. Okay. Because one, I would like to believe I know a lot about rap and I know because of how I look at rap, which is very different than a lot of people, I know why things work and why they don't work. And I've had, you know, labels want to, they've hired me to consult or tell them different things. But I've also had, as I'm sure you do from all your extensive works, people that you don't necessarily work with or getting paid for. Hey, Tony, come over here. Tell me what you think. What, what should right. be the single? Like, dude, that's been happening to me since, you know, I was in college. Because yes. when I would talk to certain artists, and I could have an in-depth conversation with them about their career, but then also talk to them about 20 other artists mm -hmm. in super detail, album cuts, da -da 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 -da. They're like, yo, man. And then that's how I started getting invited to studios. I started getting invited to this. And then um, shout out to the legendary Traxter for believing in me, but I sold beats for him. Wow. So I sold beats to Mariah Carey. I sold beats to Tech 9 I sold beats to Sibo. I sold beats to Dub C. Uh, Prozac. I sold beats to a lot of people because I just asked him, what do you do with all these other beats that don't make it on these certain projects you're doing? He's like, oh, you know, they're in my computer or I rap over. I'm like, yo, I could sell these. And then I did. Awesome. But it's because I understand like that stuff because I've been studying it and living it since I was 10 years old. Living the music, not the uh, necessarily the lifestyle per se. but Definite student you know. of, of the music and I love that. Uh, my other so thing. So if you ever know anybody that needs an A and R, please let, please shout me out. Uh, me most up. definitely, most <laughs> definitely. Uh, now, uh, here's my second question: Do you ever plan, possibly, and maybe you are, uh, maybe getting into the movie business as far as maybe making a documentary or a movie on oh, any absolutely. books? I have a an option on the history of gangster rap now and i've got some other opportunities with it and to make it into a series or a documentary so that's something i definitely want to do i've written uh i've written and sold uh one screenplay and then i have another screenplay that's rap related um that's getting some steam now that i actually have a, a meeting about tomorrow so I'm very excited about that. And it's a screenplay, so it's a real feature film. So I have a lot of that um, in the works and that I want to do. So ultimately, my goal is to have, basically, I want to be like a studio. I want to be able to make feature films that I either write, produce, and direct, or some combination thereof. I want to have documentaries that I do the same, write, produce, and or direct. And then I want to keep doing my unique access where I'm interviewing artists and talking about what's going on now, talking about historical things. And then I also want to write, and produce, and be involved in the same capacity with television shows. Because I've written and produced for VH1. I did the Ultimate Albums episode on Eminem's The Marshall Mathers LP. So for that, I interviewed Eminem, I interviewed Dr. Dre, I interviewed Snoop Dogg, I interviewed Jimmy Iovine, I interviewed Exhibit, I interviewed Big Boy, I interviewed Proof, I interviewed you know, a dozen people for that. And then I wrote that Marilyn Manson. Uh, I did that because he was in, uh, you know, one of Eminem's videos for that album. So, you awesome. know, I've written and produced for VH1. I did a show with uh, CeeLo on Fuse called Lay It Down. So I worked with CeeLo to like write the questions that he was going to be interviewing people. We did six episodes with that back in the day with, we did T-Pain, we did Little John, we did Public Enemy, we did Janelle Monet. Um, so that was a lot of fun. I want to do more of that type of stuff. Um, and that's, you know, that in the books. So those are like my four or five main right. things. And then, you know, when you help me get my dream and our job, <laughs> then, uh, you know, we'll yes. make that happen. So, you know, well, you produced the album, I'll and r it, and now we just need a rapper. There, there you go. There you go. Let's there make it go. happen. Let's make it happen. You know, one thing about the documentary that I wish I could have given more, even though I had no complaints from the public, I have yet to hear anybody complain that uh, it was too long. As a matter of fact, I had people told me that they didn't think it was long enough. They wanted more because they were learning. One thing that I get a lot is that I, I got to live it, even though I wasn't there. Okay. Um, but one thing I wish I could have gave more was a little bit more history of Steve Yano as a person. Right. But I had to, um, if you will, respect Susan, his wife's wishes, because she just said, if you're going to do it, Tony, you want my blessing. I just want you just to talk about Steve, the vendor right. at the Swami, and that's it.
Hmm. And I said, okay, I wish I could have gave a little bit more, you know, because people wanted to know where did Steve come from, who was Steve, what was he raised at, and I had to respect her wishes, so I, I of did. Of course. It. So, but but you know, I think only like one or two people asked me. I, well, I wanted to know a little bit more about Steve, and I just had to uh, email them back and tell them, you know, because of this reason. But uh, other than that, uh, one thing that we actually put a halt on, and we we started to do it. Uh, me and my team here, whether it be John and my boy DG. Uh, we started to do a Chicano rap documentary, hmm. uh, almost like a follow-up to this because Steve Yano uh, believed in the, the future of Chicanos. He believed in the, uh, the future of Chicano rap. He signed a group called Proper Dos, Ernie right. G, Frank B from Santa Monica. And uh, he always thought, this is going to be big, this is going to be big, okay? So I thought, let me continue to carry on the torch. But for that, we need funds. There's no budget. So we actually had to stop, you know, because okay. we just can't keep coming out the pocket. Right, right. And, and try to give it to Netflix for $35,000. That ain't going to work. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? So uh, uh, eventually, if the public would like to contribute, we would like to set, set up a Patreon page where people give. Right, and, right. E and somehow we make them a part of the documentary where we either put them on the credits or something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, but that's that's what it's in the work for us other than uh, trying to make this podcast successful uh, uh, for Chicano rappers and, uh, you know, black rappers and white rappers and all different walks of, you know, well, life. Hopefully one day we can do something together then. Most definitely. Let's make it happen. Yeah, I would definitely, lo I would definitely love to do that, Soren. So other than that, at this point, uh, well, let me bring up. I know they can reach you at uh, uh, Soren Baker at Instagram, uh, Unique Access, yep. Instagram. All of that should be coming up. And also on YouTube, it's Unique Access, correct? Unique Access Entertainment, so ENT. Yes, definitely look up his YouTube, subscribe, uh, follow him because he has a lot of interesting, awesome content, especially when you go over certain verses, when you go over certain albums, you know, and you interview people, it's really, really good. You cover all aspects of, of hip hop, not necessarily just gangster rap. But other than that, any shout outs you want to give uh, uh, as we come to a close? Yeah, I got to shout out my parents for believing in me since day one. Shout out my daughter, Lauren, my woman, my love, Davida, and just, I have, you know, I could be here three right. days thanking everybody but i'll keep it to them and just everybody that supported me i will give a special shout out to george hinojosa my manager for helping me with this book and samantha uh, abrams for helping me with the book i exhibit for writing forward and then as you showed in the the clip like i just had so many of the artists that i interviewed for the book promote the book for me as well like snoop gave me an amazing shout out dr dre uh, did as well. Ice T, DOC. I mean, it's just MC Ren, the wow. list, DJ Quick, MC8, on and on and on and on. Game. Just so many people just really helped me, supported me, promoted the book, gave me their time. And, you know, I just called them or whatever, and they, they came through for me and helped make this book, you know, a reality. And for that, you know, it's amazing. I did book signings. Dana Dane hosted one for me. Mers did one for me. Adrian Young let me use his studio. So I've just had a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, love and support that I've gotten from the book and then throughout my whole career and also through Unique Access. So I'm very fortunate that, you know, I've, I've got a little bit of momentum, man. Awesome. So I'm trying to awesome. get to the next level. Most definitely. And, and you're on your you're on your way up. Uh, let me go ahead and give my shout outs. First of all, I always like to thank John motherfucking Elkins for making this possible. Uh, uh, my right hand man, my business partner. So I thank him. Uh, I like to give credit where credit is due. Uh, also, my, my good friend, Daniel Jones, DG. Uh, you can reach him at DG Media Clips or you can reach John. Actually, he has his own page now. John motherfucking Elkins on IG. So make sure you guys follow him. Okay. Uh, he'll be coming out with his lotion soon. Uh, <laughs> so, so. Uh, other than that, uh, uh, Soren Baker for coming once again, for uh, giving me the honor and the pleasure to to be able to interview him. Uh, I'm usually sitting on the other side and he's interviewing me, yeah. but we definitely got to get together and do another interview. Yeah, man. Other I than that, it. thank you. Yes. Uh, um, other than that, um, once again, if you haven't gone already, the question was, uh, what music did Schoolie D, uh, if you will, what what was the movie that helped him get more famous that 
He had many songs. I forgot. I, I think I butchered that, Soren. It's all good. It's what movie featured Schooly D's music extensively that helped Schooly D get famous through movies and then get movie work. That's, yes. That's the question. Go to rodentradio at gmail.com and answer the movie. The first one that answers it will contact you via email uh, that you've won and will ship this to you. And once again, I just want to thank the subscribers. I want to thank the fans uh, for subscribing to uh to um, Tony Vision. Make sure if you haven't subscribed, you subscribe and hit the bell button uh, for future content. Help me get 10,000 subscribers by the end of February. That's my goal. That's my goal. And if you have not seen the Rodeo Mixtape documentary, go to documentary.com for unlimited streaming. Once again, if you want the five CDs, go to uh, um, uh, documentary.com and hit the do donation button. For 25 bucks, I'll send you all five, 25 or more and uh, we'll send these out to you right away so once again the book the mixtapes and the documentary so support thank you guys very much god bless uh, uh and once again our prayers are with the families that uh lost their loved ones today uh rest in peace kobe Bryant, laker legend like los angeles legend he meant uh, the world to us so god bless see you guys wednesday thank you